Welcome on this uh, beautiful autumn day, spring day. It's it's Gary's kind of weather. He's from uh, Montana, as I'll describe. But no, w- welcome to the second uh, Vincent and Eleanor Oster Memorial Lecture. Uh, we established this lecture just last year in February in memory of the Ostroms. Uh, for 48 years, the Ostroms worked tirelessly at I- IU, beginning in 1964, ending when both the Ostroms passed away in June of 2012. Uh, Vincent came to campus as a professor in the Department of Government. Uh, Lynn arrived without a job, uh, but got a position the subsequent year as an assistant professor. The Workshops Foundation uh, was approved by the Political Science Department in January of 1973. Both Ostroms worked on how people organized themselves to solve complex problems. Vincent concentrated on federalism and governance, specifically Tocqueville, Hobbes, and the Federalist Papers by Hamilton. Uh, Lynn concentrated on natural resource governance. She won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2009 for her work in this area on economic governance, especially the commons. So today's speaker... Uh, is an appropriate one to follow last year's speaker, Barry Weingast. Uh, Gary is the professor of corporate environmental management at the Donald Bren School of Environmental Science and Management and professor of economics at UCSB. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau for Economic Research, uh, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, a senior fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, As I noted, he uh, received his bachelor's from Montana uh, and his Ph.D. from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, He is clearly among the world's leading scholars working on property rights, institutions, and natural resources, both historically and contemporaneously. Uh, He's received numerous honors and awards, including being president of the International Society for the New Institutional Economics, president of the Economic History Association, and president of the Western Economics Association. We're just honored to have Gary Leibcap with us today, and please uh, join me in welcoming him. Well, it's really wonderful to to be here. Um, Back to IU, a place that uh, I've always liked. Um, The campus is just spectacular. I'd forgotten how how, how gorgeous it is. But the intellectual uh, legacy, both uh, from past workshops that I have uh, participated in and then uh, just the colleagues that I have here, it's it's just been tremendous. And then as Lee um, mentioned, you also managed to throw in a little bit of Montana and uh, winter, and uh, I was glad for that because uh, it's against the law in Santa Barbara to have anything below 60 or so. So, uh, uh, and when people asked me whether or not this was bothering me, and I said, "No, I'm going to be home Thursday night. Uh, I'm going to be fine." So, uh, so anyway, um, so uh, what I want to do is to. Uh, go over some points with you, and I would keep it short, and so we have plenty of time uh, for discussion. Um, first off, I, I just want to say, um, as for all of us, it's just hard to describe the uh, intellectual and personal uh, attachment that uh, that I have, and that many of us have had uh, with. Uh, uh, Lynn and Vincent. Uh, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Uh, there are others that I also uh, just have a huge debt to Douglas North, uh, um, Oliver Williamson, uh, and, and so forth. But Lynn and Vincent were not only great, as you all know, great uh, scholars, but they're just great people. And uh, uh, when I, I saw this picture and I thought, the, mind, the word that came to my mind instantly was that just they're adorable. <laughs> so I, that, that's uh, and we'll come, we'll come back to them, uh, but they really were. So um, as Lee mentioned, uh, I throughout my career have been interested in many of the problems that both Lynn and Vincent were interested in. Uh, in fact, I'm now working on water, and it's sort of remarkable. I'm 
back into some of Vincent's 1950s uh, papers. Uh, sort of, again, a little humbling when you realize that Vincent was writing uh, had, had papers of this quality uh, when, you know, I was still trying to figure out if I was going to go to first grade or not. So, uh, uh, it, you know, it's just, it's just, it's amazing. But there are all sorts of interesting uh, problems out there, and the question is, well, how do we address them? What are the sources, and what are the ways to deal with them in a way that make society generally uh, generally better off? So I have, I have uh, two points that I want to make uh, today. Uh, well, first of all, I'm just going to generally lay out the problem of open access. Uh, for me, it's I go to sleep at night with that. I wake up in the morning with that in my mind. My kids always thought I was a little bit crazy, um, but for the, the rest of you, if you're not, um, you don't, you're not similarly inclined, it's, it's worthwhile to go over that. And then there's the question of how we address that these problems. And I want to really uh, emphasize... Uh, to some degree, Lynn's uh, criticisms, but primarily focus on, on COSAs and then how these have been incorporated in, in, in the scholarly literature and, and policy and where they haven't been and where I think both ought to, ought to go. Um, I'm going to talk, take COSAs' arguments about transactions costs and incorporate political costs because in the case of an open access resource, as, as we'll see, we're just using too much of it. Too many people are using it. And so that means if we're going to address the problem, somebody has to be constrained. There have to be some cutbacks. And so the question is, well, how, how is that going to take place? And oftentimes it involves the state. And we'll see there in some, in some policy response. And what's remarkable, I, I think, in the economics literature, the political science literature, and in, in the legal literatures that I'm familiar with, the, the lack of careful analysis of how the state responds, what it is that makes politicians respond in the way they do, what it is that motivates agencies, and whether or not we might think that this is the optimal response, um, there, there just isn't much out there. And that's what I'm, I'm going to call. And, and Coase was implicitly arguing for this, and I want to I carry that forward. Um, the, uh, I want to, in that regard, argue that uh, when agency officials and politicians are responding to a problem, that there's the potential here to create a, another problem that's really symmetrical with market failure that I'll come back to. Because neither the politician nor the agency official is an owner. They're not strictly the residual claimant of their actions. They don't bear all the costs in the same way that we see in, in market failure. And so we also have a, a, the potential to have too much or too little resource or environmental regulation. And I want to come back with that because it has important, I think, welfare implications. Um, and then I want to turn to uh, uh, where the literature, the, re, the scholarly literature and policy have incorporated Coase's arguments to some degree um, and then show why it, that's been uh, shallow in some sense, uh, that, they've, uh, that there's been a general uh, overlook of some key issues with regards to markets. And so um, I'll, I'll come back to that. And then all that will be embedded with a call for naturally uh, for more research and consideration on these issues. Certainly in, by the end of the post-war period, um, uh, in the, by the 1960s, there's greater concern about externalities, environmental problems, growing air pollution, uh, depletion of fisheries, um, growing advance of deserts over, har or over grazing of pastures, um, drawdown of aquifers. We're even more concerned about that today. I mean, these problems persist, and the question is, well, why do they persist? But this is the time when, when they were... Uh, when they were really uh, starting to emerge. And the academic, uh, certainly the economics, but it, it's, I think, fair to say the legal and political science literatures, um, and the policy response went back to earlier work uh, in the 20th century uh, in welfare economics with regards to Pigouvian taxes or taxes that would raise the costs of, of actions by the parties that 
um, raise their private costs to be commensurate with social costs. And where taxes weren't adopted, then we were to have some kind of regulatory restraint around something that was more optimal rather than the amount of activity associated with, with over-harvest or over-fishing or over-drawdown of aquifers. And the literature is all over that. Uh, the optimal design of, of, of tax policies, optimal regulatory policies, uh, classic articles on prices versus quantities, which we do uh, tax or regulate and so forth. Um, the, the sad fact about that for people who are in this literature and the policies that have been responded to that um, is one is we don't see very many Pigouvian taxes anywhere. And so the question is, well, why might that be? And I think that that is absolutely open for positive analysis. What is the, in this case, the political transaction costs why are parties so opposed to these taxes that we tend not to see them rather than to offload this into something called lack of political will, which is just an empty box? Um, so, um, so that is one issue. The other issue is that regulation in itself, as we'll see in some specific examples, is often very costly and not effective. And so it is that benchmark that has led to the turn to something that has generally been labeled a cosian approach, um, which is around the rubric or the, the, the approach of cap and trade. And so I'll, I'll come back to that and then point out some problems I see with the way in which it's been implemented. So these standard uh, approaches uh, of tax and or regulate uh, were, were, were really challenged um, uh, specifically by Ronald Coase in his 1960 article, uh, the, the Problem of Social Cost. But Lynn had also uh, been responding uh, negatively as well, primarily more to, I think, Garrett Hardin's uh, The Tragedy of the Commons uh, piece that sort of argued that once this, these conditions set in, uh, agents are just pushed to destroy the resource. And, and her and, and many of her colleagues at the, at the workshop have said, hey, wait a minute, we observe in our case studies and, and so forth, we observe conditions where uh, local parties are actually able to manage uh, these resources in a very effective way. And so she brought attention to, to that uh, local collective action solution uh, in, in, in these common resource problem management regimes. Um, and then Oliver Williamson, who I studied under at the University of Pennsylvania, wasn't directly interested in natural resource problems so much, but he was interested in transactions costs, how they defined the boundary of organizations, why firms had vertically integrated and, and, and in it for efficiency reasons, and, and so forth. And so it has the same flavor of when would organizations emerge or institutions emerge to address an environmental problem where we're bearing a lot of costs. Okay? And so this is uh, kind of the intellectual history that, uh, or legacy that I draw upon. But I'm going to emphasize Coase mostly um, because that's kind of, that's where my research has been. Uh, as Lee mentioned, I'm interested in property rights where they emerge, why they take the forms that they, uh, they have. And most often I've been interested in formal property rights. And I don't view this as really a competitor to the informal ones in, in smaller group settings, but rather an extension. Once you get beyond that setting, situation, where party, there are more people, more parties, they have different views of the, of the resource and what have you, then a formal property right often is the is the best instrument uh, to assign costs and benefits so parties engage in, in a sense of more responsible, uh, take more responsible actions with regard to the resource. And so when Coase was writing, um, his examples were, his iconic examples to illustrate the problem of social costs were environmental ones. Uh, he was talking about noise pollution, um, straying cattle, destroying a farmer's crops, um, <clears throat> factory air pollution, damaging the laundry, uh, and railroad sparks burning uh, 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 crops and, and, and what have you. And these are uh, iconic, again, examples of market failure, argument being that 
in this case, the, the, the herder who is, uh, whose cattle are damaging the crops of the farmer uh, is not fully internalizing those costs and therefore uh, has too many cattle, doesn't constrain them, and, and so forth. And um, all of these examples, uh, the railroad and with the sparks and so forth, in a standard uh, Pigouvian or standard uh, response to this is polluter pays, okay? And that is then we need to constrain the party that's the source of the problem. The herder has to restrain the cattle or the railroad has to cut back on sparks. And in Coase's little parables, he, he said, you know, this might not be socially beneficial, Okay? It might actually be more beneficial to society more broadly if the farmer internalized those costs and paid the herder, or in the case of the railroad and, and sparks uh, spread, spreading to fields, that the railroad be paid to cut back. The point being that we would get different, net, we might get different outcomes in terms of if the railroad has to stop running trains or the, uh, the herder has to stop running cattle, society might be worse off even though the farmland might be preserved or we might have fewer fires. And so Coase said that these standard ways of thinking of market failure really do not look at the trade-offs. Um, and, uh, uh, and so his fundamental argument is you wanted to compare alternatives and be clear of what those alternatives might be. And so in addition to that, he was pointing out that these environmental problems are reciprocal. Um, if you, in the case of the farmer and the, and the herder again, um, if the herder is restrained, the farmer is inflicting costs on the herder, or if the herder is um, damaging the crops of the farmer, then the farmer or the herder is inflicting costs on the farmer. One way or the other, there, these pro this problem is symmetrical. Now, of course, the simple one, uh, but nevertheless, the idea was, he said, without knowing the property rights, who has the right to avoid the harm, then it's hard to know uh, how we might proceed. So that was one of his arguments, and he was pretty agnostic about how you assign these property rights. In fact, the famous Coase theorem that was developed later was that once you... Uh, uh, it doesn't matter uh, how you assign the property right if there are no costs to trade um, or assigning the right. Well, then you assign it, and just through trade, we'll go to the socially optimal uh, outcome. The, if the farmer has the right not to have his crops damaged, then uh, the, and it's more valuable for the herder to expand the herd, then the herder will pay the farmer and do that, or vice versa. If the crops are more valuable, the extra cattle, then the farmer will pay the uh, uh, the herder to pull back, to pull back the cattle will still get the same outcome, and that was then later coined the, the Coase theorem. And but the, the problem with this is that, um, uh, at least in the economics literature, but elsewhere, is that uh, most people say, well, okay, so this is interesting, uh, but tr transactions costs are positive, um, so we really can't go there. Uh, it's an interesting thought experiment, but. Um, uh, there's not much more to, to be done. Um, but it misses some fundamental points. And one of them is that Coase argued uh, implicitly that uh, the standard polluter pays paradigm or approach might not be socially welfare enhancing. And in fact, we might want to have a, a case where the beneficiary pays, okay? That it is less costly to society if the beneficiary, in a sense, buys off the polluter. We get the polluter to comply and, and what have you. There's less transactions costs all around, and this uh, might be the way to solve the problem more, more rapidly uh, and more completely than a standard polluter pays approach. Um, throughout the Coasean analysis was, although we wanna, we're concerned about the environmental and resource problem, the key was maximizing social welfare. And so it might be, in some cases, it's too costly to solve the problem, okay? And if you're an advocate and you are concerned about depletion of fisheries or loss of habitat or whatever, it's pretty unsatisfying. But from society's general view, uh, that, 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 might, uh, uh, that might not be the case. Um, 
And the other point that he makes throughout the, the, the article, uh, which apparently is the most cited article in economics, not necessarily the most incorporated, but most cited, uh, is that um, um, we need clear benchmarks to compare alternatives and their, their social welfare implications. Um, nevertheless, after Coase's article, there has been, uh, for sure, um, recognition of Coase's. Every, virtually every environmental textbook will have uh, some a, a paragraph or page or whatever to Coase, uh, and there has been uh, large-scale, and I'll come back to this, adoption of cap-and-trade in many cases, and, uh, and that's always labeled as being co- a Coasean uh, approach. Um, nevertheless, there are some, I think, astonishing um, um, weaknesses in the, in the way in which those policies have been put into place, and I just don't see in the literature discussion of what the welfare implications of those might be. And so we, we'll come back to that. So the, 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 the two key points that I'm going to make in the, in the remainder of my talk are the following. One is that when we're, we're turning to politicians or agency officials to solve this problem or help solve this problem of of open access, of too many parties depleting resources, and they make decisions. They're making decisions without bearing the full social cost of their decisions. In the same way that when market failure occurs and I am a herder and I'm not bearing the full social cost of putting too many uh, livestock on, 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 the, on the range, um, because I'm not bearing the full social cost, I, my incentive is to overstock, all right? In the same way, a politician or agency official who isn't bearing the full social cost of their actions can overregulate or underregulate depending on how, how the um, signals that they get from constituencies are aggregated and, and they decide they have to respond to them. So One of my points, then, is we have two sources, frankly, of social cost. One is the standard market failure that we know so well and we have laid out in so much detail, and then government failure, and this government failure is due to the fact, the same problem, that politicians and agency officials bear certain costs but not the broad social costs associated with their policies, and hence we might get a a similar distortion. The second point I want to make is where COSIN analysis has been put into place that the, the actual structure of the market has not really been considered. We see that the property rights are very weak in many cases, which ought to shorten time horizons and incentives, and in most cases, trading is, is sharply restricted. So you can, on the one hand, say, gee, we're doing a COSIN market, COSIN exchange, and then on the other hand, you can't you can't engage in much exchange, and the property right uh, is, is very weak. And so it would be worthwhile then to evaluate why those restraints are put into place, and secondly, what their outcomes, how they affect performance of this, of this particular kind of instrument. Okay. <clears throat> so that's, those are the two points that we'll, we'll focus on. Um, and so this is what I meant. I, I think the – or what I just said – When government officials uh, are making decisions, we can have a problem that's really symmetrical to uh, private parties. And for politicians, it's – we can specify, if we want to get into this, what it is a politician is trying to maximize. In the way, we have a a good theory in economics uh, about – what motivates consumers to maximize utility and what motivates, motivates uh, firm owners to maximize profits. We can, we can argue that uh, a politician wants to maximize votes if it's in a, a, a democracy or other, other forms of political support to remain in office. So I think we can specify that uh, and then look at how that, that plays out. Uh, with, a, with an agency, as I'll come back to, it's much more difficult. The welfare effects in a Coasean way, I think, depend on the nature of interest group lobbying. That is, if if there are many interest groups competing for a government response to over-harvest or over-fishing or over-emissions of of particulates or what have you into the atmosphere, and many uh, interest groups are competing to get 
their preferred level of constraint and their preferred instrument put into place and so forth. Then politicians have lots of signals and they can they can sort of aggregate across those those various interests and come up with something that might be more closely socially optimal. Um, on the other hand, um, if that's not the case, if there is a single interest group, there's not an inter, uh, lobby group uh, competition, then it's quite possible that the politician will be responding to that, those signals, that information, the interests of that group, and the broad interests of society are really not are really not uh, are really not reflected, and there's just very little literature on this. Um, and I'll give you just a, a quick example of why I think this could be important. Um, I had um, I teach benefit cost analysis uh, for our, our professional master students, and so we're always into how to value the environment, which is really hard. And um, so there's an interesting paper. Uh, that two former colleagues of mine uh, worked on when ANWR was a hot issue back about 2006, 2007. And, uh, you know, that's the, the North Slope up in Alaska, and in, in, it's at a wildlife preserve. And so uh, many people were concerned about if there were oil development up there, um, it could harm caribou migration and, and there could be other damages. And it's just hard to figure out what those, those lost values might be. So they took what I thought was a very novel approach and said, all right, let's calculate what the benefits of oil development might be as best we can because that gives us, in a sense, a benchmark of what the costs would have to be uh, of, of, of having the development in order for you uh, to have a benefit-cost ratio of at least equal to one. Okay? So... It's a tremendous, uh, I think, uh, approach just to give, put some bounds on this thing. And so what they did is they, they went and they calculated the lost oil revenues and the taxes to the state of Alaska and the federal government and, and, and revenues to oil companies and, and, and what have you. And the opportunity cost of not producing oil up there, this is the old days when oil was worth $50 a barrel, uh, um, and, uh, but, but seriously, they get a big number. And then they divide that big number by the voting age population in the United States, and they get about $1,200 uh, uh, present value calculation of about $1,200 per voting age adult in this country. Now these were two environmental uh, economists, and so they're not, they're, 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 you know, they didn't have an agenda, but they ask at the end of the article. Is it the case that ANWR was valued broadly across the society uh, at $1,200 uh, per person? Or was it primarily the, the holding of ANWR in its pristine state, even with these opportunity costs, was primarily uh, uh, due to the interests of, of a particularly well-organized groups? And they just leave it at that. But that's sort of the, the point I wanted to make. When politicians or agency officials are responding to these interest group pressures, if there isn't sort of broad counter competing interests at hand that are, are sort of equally uh, well organized, then politicians could respond either with too much or too little environmental regulation in the same way that uh, private actors could engage in generally too much extraction of a resource, or if we have positive externalities, too little of it, okay? Now, with administrative agencies, I said the problem is even more severe because we, we don't have a good way of modeling or predicting how they'll behave. And now, why, why is that? Well, uh, and so here I can borrow to some degree, so most of my intellectual legacy is tied to Lynn, but... But Vincent, actually, with his polycentric governance and so forth, really was interested in various levels of government and how they respond. He didn't really get into the nitty-gritty of agencies, as I'm calling for here. But so here's the problem with agencies. Most agency officials, these are our career civil servants, have tenure. They cannot be easily fired. They're paid on a national pay scale, so there's very little use of merit pay. And so they're paid with the passage of time. They can't be fired. So what's the motivation? When they, they're delegated, you know, they, they have the mandate to administer, implement uh, 
laws passed in, by the legislature and, and the executive, but how do they choose the instrument? How do they choose how to respond and so forth? I don't have an answer to that. There is, a, there is some literature out there, uh, and much of it is, is not that quantitative. It's sort of lining uh, agency officials with uh, their own discipline bias and, 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 and so forth. But since they, they care, have enormous power in terms of how policies are actually implemented, it really requires a lot more investigation into how these policies uh, unfold, how or not, whether or not they're going to be effective, and what their overall social welfare implications might be. Um, and so these are the kind of the, the two key contributors to this second source of, 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 uh, of social cost. Um, so market failure and government failure. And if we're then wanting to consider about solving some important problem in a fishery or groundwater or air or whatever, we, it seems like, if we're concerned about maximizing social welfare, we have to weigh these two costs. On the one hand, market failure, private agents overdoing things, and then the associated costs of the political and bureaucratic response. And it could be that the response will be more costly that to society than just not addressing the problem at all. I'm not suggesting that is, but it just seems like that's where research has to go so we know in a positive sense whether environmental resource policy on net is, is beneficial to society. The second problem that I wanted, want to point out is that where cap and trade, and what this involves, is setting a cap on overall harvest of a particular fish, stock, uh, overall emissions in an area, uh, overall habitat destruction, and, and what have you. That's the cap. And then assigning shares to that cap and giving those to, uh, to the agents. This is usually used when it's not, for a variety of reasons, not feasible to uh, strengthen or assign a property right to the resource itself, but rather to the use of the resource. Okay. And then in a strict Kosian sense, you'd assign these things and these shares and they would be traded. And, and uh, then the parties would act because the value of their shares depends upon solving the problem associated with the cap. The cap creates scarcity. They can consolidate these in fisheries. You reduce harvests and number of vessels and what have you. So that's, that's, the, that's the logic or the theory behind it. Um, but in fact... Uh, the actual design of these things is, is far more limited. And so the question is, well, why might that be? And I'll give you examples. And what are the performance implications? So let's look at fisheries, because these are the ones where we've really, there's been a lot of activity. Um, fisheries were initially uh, subject to regulation. We had all sorts of restrictions on who could enter the fishery, um, when they could fish, seasons, and the kinds of equipment they can use, and so forth. And this was everywhere all the time. And invariably, probably, I'm sure since I say that, there'll be some, some alternatives. But, but by and large, these have not been very effective, these regulations. Uh, in most cases, fishers are quite ingenious in figuring out how to get around them, and uh, the stock still falls. And um, the, the, the most egregious example that I can think of uh, uh, is at the Pacific Northwest halibut fishery where the season actually was reduced, the annual season, to six days in the Canadian fishery and four days in the U.S. And that's all the halibut you could catch all year long. Yeah. And so it's a derby fishery. It's dangerous and and all the capital investment to catch all it would have to do. So you can imagine. So once they have been adopting these, uh, these cap and trade systems, uh, the number of vessels has gradually been reduced. You can fish longer so you have more valuable harvest. And uh, uh, the stocks have rebounded. And there's an interesting article, again, by some of my colleagues uh, in science about how the stocks have rebounded where, where ITQs have been put into place. So you'd think, gee, that's wonderful, and it is. But the other uh, more sobering facts are 
that only about 7% of the world's fisheries have these ITQs. They've been around now for over 20 years of individual transferable quotas, ITQs, and only about 26% of the total uh, value of world catch. And so the question is, well, why are they so constrained? And then where they're put into place, they're often very limited in, in terms of their market design. In the U.S. and Canada, these shares are explicitly not a property right. They're a privilege that can be revocable at any time without compensation. You would think or predict that this could shorten time horizons and incentives for the parties involved. Moreover, we restrict very tightly the, the, the exchange that's possible. In some fisheries, you can only trade down. You can't trade to anybody who has a larger vessel. Concern about consolidation and, in, 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 and increased uh, vessel size. We're going to keep small fisheries, uh, vessels, and so forth. Um, that you're limited in how many of these you can hold and, and so forth. The, the point is the, this is inconsistent with a Kosian market because a property right is weak and the amount of trade is limited. Now, there can be very good reasons why these are put into place. These would be political transactions costs, just like we have – we don't have complete property rights in, in certain fisheries is the underlying reason why we have um, – open access problems. So it seems like we'd want to investigate why these fisheries ITQ systems are so constrained and then compare them to see what the performance implications might be. And that literature just isn't there. There have been some comparisons with New Zealand and Australia, uh, Iceland, where the, where the ITQ or the, these fish shares are, are an, an actual property right. And so there's an opportunity there to see whether these perf those perform better in stock maintenance and so forth, well, uh, wealth generation, than our more constrained ones in the U.S. and Canada. Then let's turn to uh, air emissions. Um, and again, it's the same, the same story. Um, so the idea with cap and trade there is you put a cap in total emissions and, and allocate shares. Uh, in, in that emissions to make them tradable. Um, the, the, the most successful uh, uh, program, uh, we had uh, a cap and trade in, in lead, in, in, in lead uh, reduction, but the, the really big one was the nationwide uh, SO2 uh, uh, market, this acid rain. And prior to the – just as in fisheries, these cap and trade systems tend to come into play when regulation just doesn't seem to be doing it. And enough parties see that so that it get, the cap and trade gets adopted. So in the case of the acid rain regulation uh, under the Clean Air Act, it just was becoming increasingly costly and unlike the, unlikely that we would meet the objectives, the timing objectives. And so uh, in the early 1990s, there was this adoption of, of, of uh, tradable emission permits. That had been discussed, by the way, in the 1970s uh, by economists in the 1960s. The SO2 market moved so quickly, and we have a lot of evidence on this, a lot of empirical investigation. Um, it moved very quickly and uh, uh, reduced acid rain uh, or the emissions of sulfur dioxide, met the target quicker at about the third the estimated cost of what would have been the case under the standard regulation of the Clean Air Act. That was just tremendous. And then the system collapsed. Why did it collapse? Well, the Environmental Protection Agency, which was uh, administering the program, uh, had some other uh, regulatory issues, downwind particulates, that it, it, it was concerned about. And so it started to modify the exchange rate about how many permits you had to release uh, give up in order to release 1,000 uh, tons of, of sulfur dioxide into the air. And um, um, the uh, agency, in order to do that, and the, the downwind problems were in particular parts of the country, then restricted trade across the country. And there were court challenges and efforts to go to con Congress and, and back and forth. At the end of the day, the whole thing collapsed. And what's important back with the fishery is that these air emission 
permits, again in the law, were privileges. They were not compensable, and they could be eliminated at, at any point in time. And, in fact, that's what, was, what happened, and it's been estimated there was about $3 billion worth of permits that had been banked uh, by various utilities uh, when, when, the, when the program collapsed. So it doesn't exist anymore. If this were only one example, it would be, uh, be uh, perhaps uh, just that. But it, this, these kind of problems permeate all of the existing uh, air emission cap-and-trade systems uh, that are, are we, we're familiar with uh, that are underway right now. Um, generally, some, some cross-cap-and-trade uh, uh, system characteristics are often not possible to bank these things. Um, so, or you can trade with only within and bank them only within phases. So at the end of the phase, the values go to zero, so it changes time horizons. Um, when these permits are uh, increasingly, they're auctioned, and the auction funds are used then to subsidize, in the case of CO2 regulation, renewable fuels and other green uh, energy. Sounds wonderful except that those subsidies, the green energy, the renewable fuels that are subsidized, compete directly with what the permit price is supposed to do. The, the rising permit price is supposed to encourage utilities to look at alternative forms uh, at, uh, using market signals, whereas the subsidies are actually creating alternatives, oftentimes by others. And so, um, uh, and, and also in many cases, there are limits in, in how these things can be traded. Now, so far as I know, there are no studies out there about relative effectiveness, but none of these are getting uh, sort of straight A's. Uh, one thing, if you look at the prices, you can go on and you can get um, the, the prices for any of these um, online. None of these, pr these prices are incredibly low for the emission permits. At least they're low vis-a-vis what the estimated social cost of carbon is. Now, of course, what could that possibly be? But the government uses about $35 per ton of carbon. Um, most of these, like the, the European Union uh, uh, emission trading scheme, is trading for about, I believe, three to four euros uh, per ton. Uh, California, about $12 per ton. Uh, Reggie, uh, the... Uh, the organization uh, across states in New England and the Middle Atlantic, about $5 a ton. Why is that? I mean, there are anecdotal claims that, well, they gave out too many emission permits and so forth and so on. Well, I don't know. But it seems like we ought to be analyzing the way in which these markets were structured to see whether it's the fact that the property rights are so insecure, there's so many restrictions on trading, so much subsidization of competitors, that this tends to undermine the uh, participation and activity uh, in these markets. So the, the, in both fisheries and in air emissions, it's quite likely that these experiments in cosine exchange are not really structured to be good uh, tests of COSA's, COSA's arguments. Um, so as I mentioned, common elements across all of these uh, insecure property rights, if you participated in acid rain, the SO2 market, your utility, you would know that an agency actually could then renege on your admission permits. So you, that would be something you wouldn't forget, especially if you had part of the $3 billion of, of permits that have been banked. Uh, there are trading limits and so forth. So you would expect that these would lead to short time horizons and, um, and less investment uh, in alternatives through the exchange market than otherwise would occur. And yet, as I said, there's just... The, the literature just has not really been aimed at that and comparing what the trade-offs are relative to what might be the case if we made these markets more cosian uh, in the sense of actual having more secure property rights and tradable. Why were these constraints adopted? These are political transactions, costs, lobbying. It would be worthwhile to get into that to see why. The, is it the agency that's concerned? Are agencies really wanting to delegate so much authority to markets? Are they really concerned that they wouldn't be able to be flexible in their responses? Possibly. Okay. And then what are the trade-offs here? So 
to conclude what I have have such a debt to the coast, Toronto coast and to the Ostroms was their emphasis implicitly or explicit in comparative uh, institutional analysis and which ones were really uh, aligned to maximize social welfare. Um, to analyze this, these sorts of problems, you want to look at the comparable uh, transactions costs, both private and, and political and how they affect different institutional outcomes. So when we're talking about regulation working or not, it's vis-a-vis what feasible alternative, or taxes, vis-a-vis what feasible alternative, or COSI and trade, vis-a-vis what feasible alternative. And then to look more explicitly at how politicians, who are they responding to, why are they responding in the way that they are, and how what is it that motivates the agency? Is the agency really carrying out the broad interests of society or the interests of the agency in particular in particular interest groups? So these are the key problems, and I want to get back to uh, Vincent and Lynn and once again thank them, thank the workshop and all of the wonderful activities that not only historically have been going on here, but the ones that are planned as, as you move forward to new new horizons and new opportunities because there's just a lot to do. So thanks very much. <clears throat> well, um, thank you very much, Gary. I'm, I'm hoping that Lynn and Vincent were able to tune in and uh, watch the live stream because uh, they would have enjoyed this. Uh, so Lynn and Vincent, I... Hope you liked it. Uh, And Gary, thank you very much. This was a very fitting lecture. We have time for uh, questions, uh, and we've got students with microphones, so please use the microphone. Hi. Um, uh, Gary, you talked about a number of very interesting problems with cap and trade uh, and how the provision and of those uh, rights have been complicated and so that, in one case, the system collapsed. Uh, what you didn't talk about and would like you to address is the enforceability of these uh, caps. When you get a cap, you have the right to pollute uh, or overfish. Uh, but uh, these externalities historically have been hard to identify, uh, and uh, in fact, the enforceability uh, for society as a whole could be considered the broad question. So could you talk about uh, how these um, cap-and-trade systems uh, have or have not been successfully enforced? Yeah, uh, actually, I don't hear so well, so Lee was here to translate the question, but... uh, but, I, but I, got a, I got this one. So that's a, a tremendous question. And so first off, the, the issue would be enforcing a cap and the, and the use rights within it vis-a-vis a regulation or tax. So then you'd want to see which one, which of the, across those three regimes has the lower enforcement costs as part of total analysis of transactions costs. Um, let me talk about fisheries because, see, that, that in a way – uh, you know, I, th- I think we can make clear predictions. The arguments are, and uh, the empirical evidence appears to be, that enforcement is far better than under other regulatory regimes. Now, why might that be? In a cap-and-trade system uh, in, in, with fisheries, those fishers who participate can expect to capture, to, if they agree to, to participate, they can expect to capture the rents or the value that re, that occurs or accrues if the stock rebounds or is maintained. If they cheat and everyone cheats, then that's not going to happen. So these tend to be self-enforcing in fisheries. And my colleagues who work in marine sciences have all this anecdotal evidence. It would be interesting to compile this in a more statistical way to, make, to see if that happens, but at least certainly relative to regulation, where it's each fisher against, in effect, the state. 
and we know what the other, you know, there's, there are a couple of great papers on the Pacific Coast halibut fishery about all of the evasion of restrictions on entry. So they just had bigger and bigger vessels, more and more equipment, more and more crews, and, and what have you. Um, so I think enforceability for natural resources, you could imagine if the property right is more secure, then parties think long term, and these things have value only so long as the underlying stock or resource is, is rebounding or resilient. The shares in something that is depleted, you know, have no value. So I think the incentives line up pr- pretty well there. With, um, w- with air emissions, it's a little harder because there aren't, there isn't a, a resource that, that's going to rebound in a sense like fish stock. Um, but there, if, if every, they, again, you still could imagine that there would be self-policing. And apparently there's some, there's some of that in the Southern California reclaim market. That's the air emit controls on NOx, uh, nitric, uh, oxides and, and sulfur dioxide in Southern California. Um, because the, the value of the shares depended on whether or not the, the whole exercise was going to continue. So I think, you, I think you could predict, again, you'd want to go forward, but the parties have greater incentive to self-regulate and self-monitor in that setting. I don't know how the overall cap is set, and that is something then that would be subject to, you know, political pressure of alliance I described earlier and, and regulatory, uh, regulatory action. Okay. That's true. But they have that incentive under, if it's them, if it's all polluters against re, uh, the state, okay, they're not going to internalize any benefits, right? So everybody cheats if they can, right? Um, under a cap and trade system, they still might have incentive to cheat, all right? Or, okay, but they also have an instrument that they own if, if it's a secure property right that they can trade so long as the cap and trade system itself is viewed as legitimate and responsive to the problem. And I think that's, I think that incentive is quite different than a strict regulatory, uh, limit. So it's empirically testable, right? I'm not saying people are going to comply totally in either case, but I think they're more likely to comply. Uh, and, and self-monitor and monitor one another uh, in the in the cap and trade system. Questions? Generally not a shy crowd. Back there. <clears throat> I have a question. It seems that we, we need the mic for the uh, stream. It seems that many times these regulatory or these penalties don't apply unless. There's some kind of public awareness of it. It may be the dramatic depletion of the Oklahoma aquifer. It, it may be another, you know, buildings collapsing in third world countries because of lax building standards and corruption in raw materials. It seems like the, the issue doesn't get involved, doesn't get addressed until some calamitous event happens that, and then the media helps. Public awareness helps. Certainly the Internet is a wonderful tool, one of the positive things. There's many negatives, of course. But, I mean, my my question is, what advice would you give to legislative leaders to harness this to where we don't have to wait for these calamitous events happening before we make a a real quick steering direction? Well, um I, was, I just, I really hate being doom and gloom here, but, um, might as well. Um, the empirical evidence is that, you know, for fisheries, and this is a study I'd love to do and I've asked people to do, but I think it is the case that no ITQ system has been in, put into place until the stock collapses. I, I worked in oil fields, uh, and it was certainly the case the parties could not get together t- to avoid multiple firms drilling the same reservoir and depleting one another until the reservoir was near collapse. Now, why might that be? Because at that time, nobody has a stake in the status quo. 
their interests align, it becomes broadly evident that there's a problem, and you can get everybody to kind of coalesce in some kind of solution. When that doesn't happen, there are some parties that are still doing okay, and other parties not so much. And then the question is, well, how are, are the parties that are doing okay? Is their condition reflective of the broader issue with the resource, or is it the parties that are harmed? So to get back to your question, when, when would you think this? you might get preemptive action? And I think this is back to, to Lynn uh, particularly. I think you're more likely when the resource is small, spatially, the parties are relatively more limited and more generally in agreement about, about the issue, uh, about maintaining the resource, because they'll have pretty similar assessments of, of conditions. And if they see things not working, in Liz's case, they would probably modify the local controls. But if they needed some kind of something more broad uh, interventionist, uh, then you could imagine that occurring. Um, but the problem is something, for example, the Ogallala Aquifer. It's just going to be hard because it's not a bathtub. Apparently, it's an egg crate. So there are pockets here and there that are not overdrawn, other pockets that are severely overdrawn. So if you're over here, looks good, lots of recharge. You're over here, not much recharge, looks pretty bad. Very hard uh, to, to get groups together. Um, and so what's, what's really emerged on the Ogallala, for example, are pockets of regulation that are, are, are locally devised in a very Ostrom-like setting. You get these groundwater management districts, and you're over a part in, in, in western Nebraska, over part of the Ogallala, other parts of, of Nebraska above, where the, above the Ogallala, still wide open. But there's just no important problem there yet. And so I think that's the way it'll, it'll just, you know, it'll, it'll have to play out. Ken? Gary, thanks very much. For uh, uh, sorry. A very uh, engaging lecture. I, I want to take you to the Williamson roots. Uh, I also was at Penn, uh, though after him, uh, and ask you whether you've thought about the, uh, the regulatory agency's problem as – uh, analogous to the make or buy decision that a firm faces. So you've got a, you've got a choice here. You can either use a high powered incentive, the uh, cap and trade system or the tax, or you can use a hierarchical system, the regulation. They each have their strengths and weaknesses. The strength of the regulation is there's no extended negotiation to try to rework the, the, um, uh, the terms of the engagement. Uh, the agency can simply say, we're changing this and pass that down. The, the, the challenge that you've brought up is this weak property rights, and you're saying, well, uh, the, we would have a better system, I think. Uh, you're saying we'd have a better system if we could um, uh, establish stronger cop, uh, property rights. But given, given the um, – uh, uh, Weitzman kind of uncertainty in get in, in involved in setting either a price or a quantity, doesn't the agency have to retain some control over uh, uh, over the nature of that market? And the price we pay for getting some high powered incentives is that we don't we, 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 we don't get all of those high powered incentives, but at least we get some of them relative to regulation while retaining the capacity to adjust in the face of imperfect information. Oh, so I, I like that. Um, and, I, you know, I, I'm totally open to – in fact, what I want is positive analysis of these things. Um, the, uh, so with a firm, for the rest of you, the, the concern was by all, uh, that was raised by Oliver Williamson is, well, a firm could go out, you know, General Motors, they could go out and buy transmissions or it could make them internally. And so when would it buy them and when would it make them internally? And the firm is constrained generally by profit maximization requirements, cost re minimization, and, and so forth. And so it looks to, in Williamson's sense, minimize the transactions cost of production and exchange in making that decision. For an agency, <clears throat> it's not so clear exactly what it's concerned about. 
is that maximizing its budget, all right? Why we, it doesn't affect the salaries. Uh, we've actually done that analysis of the, of the rank and file uh, employees, but it does affect their mandate. So bigger budget, you get to do more things, and, and you identify with and so forth. So um, it would be worthwhile, I think, if you want to inv- go down this route to see, well, what are the incentives facing an agency to relinquish some of its authority to a Kosian market, okay? And, uh, and if in so doing, um, then what kinds of, if we find a Kosian market not working, let's say we gave a perfect one, the one I described, let's say, and it's, we still need more regulatory intervention, well, how would that take place, okay? What cost does the agency have to bear? And this is why I like a firm property right that's compensable because it forces the agency to go to Congress and say, we want to buy these back, okay, or we're going to restrain these things. We're not going to let them be bankable because some hot spots, we have these parties that have already banked them. We, we have to compensate them for it. And the reason why I like that I, from a, a, um, a sort of a, a general welfare sense is they have to go back to the legislature and get appropriations. So the legislature then has to go out weigh interest group pressures and so forth in deciding how much budget to provide. If the agency doesn't have to bear those costs, if they're all external to the agency, then the agency can take actions that it believes need to be taken, but there's no sort of easy constraint put on the agency. And I think that's what happened in the EPA uh, with the sulfur dioxide market. So anyway, perfect uh, framework, I think, the make or buy uh, paradigm to apply that to look at agency behavior across a variety of settings. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's take one more question or two, Michael. The zone, right? Okay. Uh, so, so Gary, I, a problem with the property rights argument relating to sulfur dioxide, a couple problems. One is that the mar- market functioned really well for quite some time before the collapse yeah. took place, which suggests that people weren't too concerned about you know, the lack of compensability. Moreover, there are lots of kinds of very, you know, old, well-respected property rights institutions uh, that are highly imperfect, leaseholds, right? We have all kinds of property rights far away from fee simple absolute. So in light of, of that, um, alternative hypothesis, the sulfur dioxide market collapsed because the cap was set at 50%, Everybody achieved that cap. Congress didn't ratchet the cap, right? Over the same period of time, Germany got a 90% reduction in sulfur dioxide emissions, presumably at higher cost per unit. Uh, but still, right, when you set a cap and the cap is achieved, what happens to the market? Oh, okay. Well, uh, just a couple of things. I think, you're, uh, you know, the sulfur dioxide market, it's not my thing in the sense that I've investigated it to enormous depth, but I, I have studied it. Um, I think you're right uh, that in general, even though these weren't – there was no experience with this other than the lead reduction. And that worked. There was no agency intervention. I think parties generally believed, even though it was a, a privilege that could be revoked at any point in time, that that wasn't going to happen. And uh, it, was, it was working smooth, swimmingly, was, and, and, and so um, now we may have different views, uh, interpretations of the history of why it collapsed, but clearly the, uh, the, uh, the actions of the EPA to deal with the downwind problems com- disrupted the interstate trade, and then the whole thing is in hiatus when these things are being challenged in court, and then they're appealing to Congress and and so forth. And so what happens is is it collapses, okay, ultimately. Now, why I think you're right in the sense that everybody thought that this would work and and be they they weren't going to be a subject to uh, expropriation is there were about $3 billion of these uh, from firms that had to pay ratepayers and shareholders uh, responsible to rate payers and shareholders um, that they banked. And I don't think anybody would have done that had they thought that these things would go to zero uh, value. So um, uh, I, th- I think that that 
there has been an interesting history, perhaps you have read it by uh, Schmollensee and, and Stevens, and so they they really do target the EPA actions, uh, but they have a different takeaway from that. They don't fault the property rights so much as the fact that Congress didn't didn't come back and so forth. Well, why didn't Congress come back? Seems like there's an interest group story there to evaluate evaluate more correctly. Why did the EPA decide that it could take these actions? Never had to weigh compensating the party. It never had to worry about compensating the various power companies for three billion dollars in banked assets. So that's the relevant comparison strikes me. What would the agency have done had it had to worry about compensating? It might have said, you know what, we've got a downwind problem here, Congress. We can't solve it without additional appropriations to compensate these parties for changing the exchange rate and the tradability and the bank permits that could be affected. Um, But we can't, unless you give us more money, we can't do that. And so then you have North Carolina and all the downwind states from Ohio and what have you, Pennsylvania, you know, really upset. And the agency would be wanting to do something, but it didn't have authorization from Congress or funding. And there we are. And if Congress doesn't do it, then and we and you want our, and you, we have broad competitive interest groups and so forth, then we might say, well, then that's the social outcome that is better or more optimal than the action taken. I'm not claiming that. I just think that's the analysis you'd want to engage in if, uh, before you'd want to make kind of social welfare comparisons. <clears throat> okay, we're running late, but one. Yeah, Michael, one more question, please. Yeah. And then other questions can – there's a reception following this. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that Lynn would have uh, would have cared for my question, uh, but I'll ask it anyway. So uh, market failure is, of course, defined against an ideal concept of market equilibrium with welfare theorems, uh, and, and then transaction costs – explain why social optimum is unattainable. So one can think of a an, an, uh, you know, symmetrical question when it comes to government. <laughs> Benchmark for that is a Danzin model where lobbying activities reflect uh, welfare stakes, stakes in terms of social welfare represented by different parties. And so in that frictionless world with lobby, uh, government agency does exactly what social lobby, because lobbies contribute proportionately to those wealth mm-hmm. stakes. So my question is, mm-hmm. for the purposes of symmetry, mm-hmm. can one similarly define the frictions in the government agency that do not allow Mm-hmm. No, I think it's an excellent question. It's exactly the way I would think about it. That that's what you would. That's exactly where I would look. What are these impediments? Are these from the agency, or are they endogenous to the process? Are these information problems that were raised earlier? That there's it's just there's no consensus on on how to pr- respond. Um, um, uh, or, or what have you. But that's, see, as you mentioned in the beginning, we've analyzed market failure, you know, ad nauseum. I mean, we know all of these sources of it and, and whatever, and any undergraduate in economics, if they can't answer that one, they can't, they can't get a degree in economics or pass the course. But if you want to look at these kinds of frictions about what would lead, in a sense, uh, a bureaucratic agency or the political process to take actions that seem to be not maximizing social welfare in some way. You'd have, to, you'd have to specify what that benchmark was. Then you'd ask, well, why do these exist? What is it that leads the agency to respond in the way that it has? Why have politicians acquiesced to that or led to that and so forth? That's exactly – I don't know if that's what you're asking me, but my, when I was listening to you, I thought that's the way I would approach it. Uh, if, because I think these are symmetrical, and if we gave as much attention to that problem as we do market failure, I think we'd learn a lot. 
and we probably design more optimal policies. Okay, um, great. Uh, on that note of consensus, uh, let's thank Gary. And, and please join us just across the hall uh, for a reception. Um, and again, thank you for coming. <laughs>